Hi, my name is Christian Commerce. I work as the Head of Business Development for Europe at Huasan. And today I will be your Master of Manufacturing in ENF Trade TV. At Huasan, we are the largest manufacturer of heterogeneous cells and modules worldwide. We started in 2020 and focused only on heterojunction. Do it one thing and do it right. Most of the staff of the company, especially the high management, comes from the industry with decades of experience. Today, we will introduce to you as our flagship product, our Himalaya with solar modules over 700 watts. We will do a deep dive into this product and we will start with the key components, which for a solar panel are the cells, the glass, the frame, the encapsulant and the ceiling. The solar cells are the most important part of a solar module and they define the technology. We use only heterojunction cells and we produce our own cells. The important point here is the evolution of the solar cell and we are using heterojunction 3.0 which achieves over 26% efficiency so that the module has very high power. The only thing that is actually a little bit different is these cells are made for zero basba technology to reduce the use and consumption of silver. That's the only thing that if we use a different cell, we would need to make sure that it's ready for zero basba, but the materials would be otherwise the same. Solar glass is a complicated topic, but it is quite standard in the industry. We use uh, low iron glass and it has to be very strong, so it uh, undergoes a process of heat strengthening. The front glass and the rear glass undergo this process with different ways because the rear glass needs to have some holes cut into it. And the key point about the glass is to have a uh, inbound controls for the batches that we buy to ensure that the homogeneity of the quality is always the same. The whole industry is using 2 millimeter glass and we have that. We have as well 2.5 millimeter for some applications such as vertical PV when it is frameless to have the module with a much stronger compound of glass and laminate. It is really important to have the right specification because if you, due to some constraints in the supply or because of any other reason, take a glass that is not, for instance, strengthened, you will face, uh, for instance, rear side glass breakage in a high frequency. Even if when you test it, it doesn't happen, when you have many thousands of modules in a plant, some of them will break. So it is quite, quite important to follow very strictly the specification of a strong glass that doesn't break. The frames in solar panels have been changing a lot over the time. 10, 15 years ago, frames were not very strong and today we have much larger panels, but because of the frame material, which is a more stiff aluminum, and the frame design, they are able to carry much heavier loads than back then. Regarding the material of our aluminum frame, the key point is the combination of choosing the right very stiff aluminum type and having the right design. The key points for solar is the anodizing, for avoiding corrosion and really, really just uh, that the tolerances and the design are according to the specification. Regarding our Himalaya series, we have 33 and 35 millimeter possible frames and they are not just like one design 35, 133. We have been iterating in the last years trying to balance the design to improve the bifaciality of the module and to improve the load of the module without uh, making worse one or the other characteristic. So this is really a game that continues changing over time and you don't see it, but it really has a different uh, design and technology changes inside of the frame every single year we change it. When we talk about the encapsulant, we really go to the most interesting part. The encapsulant has two main jobs originally, which is to glue everything together and to avoid the ingress of humidity or any other contamination in the module. These days, the encapsulation has another job, which is to protect the solar cells from UV irradiance. 
because UV irradiance, both for top cone or heterojunction, for back contact cell, all of the new cell topologies are susceptible to degradation because of the UV irradiance. And what we decided to do based on what was already proven and tried for heterojunction was to implement a filter in the encapsulation that would transform the UV irradiance into visible light. In this way, we avoided this degradation and that is what we are using in our solar modules all the time. For us, if you look at our bill of materials of two, three years ago and what we're using now, it has been changing because of these advancements in the encapsulation technology. If you look at the specifics of the encapsulation, uh, when you look at normal uh, modules that are not using the materials that we employ in heterojunction, there are hundreds of brands because it is a chemical product that almost everybody can do. And there is a lot of variety about thicknesses and viscosity and different points. We use a handful of suppliers because the technology that we need is only made by really a handful. For instance, Cybrid has been the pioneer that has brought light conversion film into mass production. Regarding the ceiling, um, this is something that uh, historically has been done for glass glass modules, for thin film modules, if anybody remembers them. They used to be all the rage 10 and 15 years ago, because when you have a friendless module or a thin film module, they are really delicate against humidity. Most manufacturers don't use any ceiling. Uh, because that part is given away just to the, um, to the encapsulant, though it's not a very good ceiling, but that's the function. Um, it is quite innovative and special to use a, a real edge ceiling on solar modules. It's really one of the unique points of our own brand. For us, we thought that this very well-proven material called PIB, which is used not only in photovoltaics, but as well in construction, was the perfect candidate to be the definitive barrier against humidity for solar modules. However, what I must say is that it's not very easy to use in production. It requires very fine adjusted machinery and a very fine, good fine tuning of the production to achieve the good results. It is not a tick mark that you achieve. It needs to be done correctly every single time. But when done, PIV is really important, not only for today, but if we look into the future, we see that perovskite is probably what's coming. And those cells are very, very sensitive to exterior influences, one of them being humidity and PIV sealing completely taking away the humidity is probably one of the keys that will lead to good reliability in those products. Regarding our production lines, we have a true blend of different suppliers of machinery. But I want to give a shout out to Maxell, which is our main supplier, and which is the company that probably brought uh, the heterojunction manufacturing lines to the future with improvements in terms of cost and in terms of efficiency. I want to give a very specific example with Ciro Basba. I mentioned before Ciro Basba at the cell level by Maxwell together with us and that kind of collaboration, that is the key to technical advancement because not a single company can do everything. We need to cooperate with each other. This is only an example and we have other possible examples like the dispensing of PIB with a company Huayuan and many others, but this is a blend of many companies doing small improvements. And we as a manufacturer need to talk to everyone to implement in mass production all of these new discoveries. I want to take you through the manufacturing of a solar module step by step so that you have a better idea of what's going on. The first point is that we use ingots of silicon. And we use ingots using a material that is called FBR that is relatively new and it is very cost effective compared to the old CZ material that was used before.
and that is made by the main manufacturers of polysilicon and we have our own ingot creation. Then we slice this into wafers and that is something that we do in-house because the wafers for heterogeneous can be much thinner than for topcon and if we just buy topcon wafers it is a waste of material. Once you get the wafers into your cell manufacturing, you do uh, different things. The most important point is that you do a deposition of amorphous silicon and microcrystalline silicon, and that is where we use these Maxwell machines, and those are the critical technologies. Then you do TCO deposition, which is again a deposition, but a different one, of a transparent conductive oxide, and for that, we have uh, to use uh, materials that use less indium than before, are even going to indium-free technologies in the future, because indium is a material that has a very limited supply worldwide, even for the future years. The last point in the cell manufacturing is the screen printing of the fingers on the surface of the cell. And that is probably where the most changes have been happening. Not just because now the screen printing has to be compatible with zero PASPA, but because the paste used on the metallic contacts has been changing and is even now changing step by step reducing the use of silver, but without compromising the connectivity of the cell, because that would reduce the efficiency and probably the reliability. Those are the main steps, the position of amorphous and crystalline silicon, the position of the TCO, and the structuring of the contact with screen printing. Those are the cell processes. Normally, all of them come together one package from one supplier that makes a turnkey production line for the solar cell. After the solar cell is done, it goes over, in our case just 100 meters, to the module assembly. And the module assembly is very mechanical, is a very physically imposing process, and the key points there are the stringing of the cells, which has to be done with zero basba technology, in our case, this Maxwell with gluing and pre-dispensing technology, and then with the step of applying the PIB and the encapsulation, and then the modules go into curing. The process has to be very well controlled for temperature, for time, and after that, they get flushed, control, visual control, EL control and they get out. The, the production process is quite simple, it's only four steps. And these four steps are very easy to control. So we have an integrated testing so that the solar cells get tested already within the machine and then they get sorted out. In general, you always have, after each manufacturing process, a test point. Let's go to the assembly, for instance. We do EL after stringing. This means after all of the cells have been put together, we send them into a place where there is an electroluminescence test, and that is going to check that you connected electrically well enough because the current will flow and that you didn't damage the cells because then there will not be any micro cracks. So we repeat this EL after the lamination and before the modules go into final flash testing. And the flash testing is the key point that interests customers the most. We have a company that is a third party and they supply a reference solar module. And that reference solar module has a given power and this module is put continuously into our flesh machine in order to calibrate continuously so that all of the results of how much power each solar module has can be actually proven. And that is just a few examples of all of the testing that it's done. In the last couple of years, we have improved so much because now there is machine learning to detect the slightest 
problem so that the technician only need to go and look at the images everything is recorded everything is saved and can be checked in the future and that kind of control is key for a successful manufacturing and that is the layout of how a manufacturing plan for solar modules looks like and what we are doing once the solar modules are produced, they go into logistics and they get shipped out. The whole industry has agreed on how the pallets look like and how the packaging looks like. But the implementation is the important part. We employ, for instance, uh, shock sensors in the containers so that we see if something really bad happens to them so that they get checked specifically. and. For very specific applications, we have frameless modules or modules with a very thin frame. And the logistic and the packing for those had to be done completely new. So we had to develop together with our customers new ways of doing the packaging. And now we are very happy because our results of breakage and damage are comparable to the normal modules. For the standard modules, the Himalaya, which is uh, what we are focusing on today, basically we follow best practice from the industry and it is very well solved. The most important point is that you need to test uh, because what can happen very easily is that vibration or a mechanical load makes um, the sheets touch each other and maybe break each other. We had to iterate through several ways of doing it. We had to really improve on that because everybody stopped doing frameless modules except ThinFilm. Let's say First Solar was the only one. Uh, everybody stopped, uh, let's say, seven years ago. So we had to really innovate on that. There's not much that can be said about it in terms of details, just that if you get frameless modules, you need to be careful about how they arrive. At Huasan, we have a team dedicated to the European market with over 15 people. Some of them are located in Europe, some of them are located in our headquarters in China. We actually do not answer immediately because we think it's very important to find out more details about the project in order to be able to get the right product with the right specification. And that is what we will quote. Typically, we will answer within one or two days, but create a conversation with the customer. And then in one, two or three days, depending if we need to check with planning about availability and uh, what is the time frame of the shipment, then within one or two weeks, uh, a customer should have a very high quality answer. We have quite a lot of flexibility in working with the main players using the contracts that are acceptable for them, which means that they are very in favor of the customer. In general, uh, if the customer has any kind of request, we will just review it. And if it's not too bad for us, or if it doesn't increase liabilities too much, we will just take it. In our company, we have people from all around the world and we can answer in most of the mostly used languages like Spanish, that's my mother tongue, Portuguese, Italian, French, uh, Bulgarian, of course, Chinese and many others. So when there is some kind of issue on a plant, uh, we have partners that uh, have uh, the ability to go and take a first look in order to judge if it is a problem for the product or is a system problem or something that goes in between both. So we work with partners that are closer to every PV system so that we don't need to send people from China every single time. What is Huasan proud of? And I would say, if you ask everybody, they will give you different answers. But the one thing for me that I feel very, very proud is that we have been able to bring down the cost of heterogeneous products from 2020 to now. Just imagine, at that time, the cost of a heterogeneous module was almost twice as expensive as the running technology then, which was monoperk, and now we are basically at the same level like Topcon. That has been a massive achievement because we didn't do it using very cheap components that, I don't know, dissolve or break down in a couple of years. We did that with technology, thinner wafers, different wafers, better metallization, 
different approach on uh, the assembly, zero bus bar, all of that have brought the cost down to levels that if you ask my former colleagues of 15 years ago, when I was doing heteroaction in a different company, they would not have believed it. And here we are.